24-7 World Radio. Brother Eric John Phelps with our second hour today on April 30th, 2014 on this beautiful rainy Wednesday. Continuing on here, I want to further your understanding of the Jesuit vision. Okay? And you need to get my book, Vatican Assassins, Wounded in the House of My Friends. Go to my website, vaticanassassins.org, 247worldradio.com, and you can download the book, the ebook, for $24.95. 1,836 pages, 760 portraits and pictures. I give the history of the Jesuit order from its inception to the present day, or at least to 9 11, where they orchestrated that whole thing. Get my book, read that, especially chapter 37. And you will see what the Jesuits did during World War II, 19th century, 18th century, 20th century, which is the second 30 years war. Pardon me, from 1914 to 1945. See what they accomplished. See what they did. But continuing now in The Devil in Robes, The Sins of Priests, we continue with this Jesuit oath that's recorded here in 1900. I do further declare that the doctrine of the churches of England and Scotland, of the Calvinists, Huguenots, and others of the same, of the name of Protestants or liberals, to be damnable, and they themselves to be damned who will not forsake the same. You like that? I mean, they're not only damning Protestants, they're damning liberals. If you believe in limited government, you are a liberal, according to this document, and you're damned. If you believe government should be limited by a written constitution, you're damned. Because the Jesuits are the great absolutists. They believe in unlimited government so that they can control the king or the president or the military dictator absolutely and have him do anything they want him to do. That's why they don't want anybody, any government, limited by a written constitution with a separation of powers like we used to be under before March 9th, 1933, before we were all put under Trading with the Enemy Act, where the president has absolute powers, except as he's limited by decisions of the Supreme Court, which means we have judicial supremacy, where the Supreme Court, whatever it decides, it's unlimited in its jurisdiction, it has federal question jurisdiction, it can decide to hear any case that it wants to. And we got six Roman Catholics on the Supreme Court, who do you think they serve? I do further declare that I will help, assist, and advise all or any of His Holiness's agents in any place where I shall be, in Switzerland, that's Protestant Switzerland, Germany, Protestant Germany, Protestant Holland, Protestant Denmark, Protestant Sweden, Protestant Norway, Protestant England, Protestant Northern Ireland, or Protestant America, all of these being white nations, by the way, in 1900, or in any other kingdom or territory I shall come to, and do my utmost to extirpate that means kill off or drive out the heretical Protestant or liberal doctrines and to destroy all their pretended powers, legal or otherwise. And we let Jesuits in America? Uh, you Russians, you let Jesuits in Russia? You Germans, you let J Jesuits in Germany? You English and Scotsmen, you Brits, you, uh, you allow Jesuits in your country? You Frenchmen, you allow Jesuits in your country? You Dutchmen, you allow Jesuits in the Netherlands? You Swedes, you allow Jesuits in Sweden? You Canadians, you allow Jesuits in Canada? And we Americans, we allow them here? <laughs> the problem is the Jesuits have destroyed Protestantism. And with this, that spirit of Protestantism, with the Bible being the sole authority of faith and practice, you have now lost the heart and soul of the Constitution because the Constitution is a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant document designed by a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant Presbyterian Calvinist named Pelatiah Webster. You destroy the Reformation, you destroy the very heart and soul of the Constitution. So in March 1933, when God evidently decided that this nation 
could take another step in its national judgment because it abandoned the King James Bible and it abandoned the Reformation and it abandoned uh, uh, expo impo uh, exposing the papacy and all the churches decided to say, well, Roman Catholics are Christians and the Pope's really a Christian. And, oh, yeah, I don't know that. we need to reunite. We need to be friends with them. So they can cut our throats. So they can burn us at the stake like they did in Europe for 200 years. Yeah, and they never apologized it or for it or removed their doctrine to call for it. Oh, we can reunite with those killers and murderers. That's how insane white Protestant men have become in this country. You're out of your minds. You're living in fantasy land. You'd rather watch Spider-Man or some goofball movie, The Expendables, rather than learn the truth about our history and the bloodsuckers and the killers that are at our doors running Washington, D.C. and every state house in this country. And that's the truth. While you're busy looking at pornography and lusting after your neighbor's wife. Isn't that the truth? Isn't that the truth? As the NSA screens every one of us and where we go with our computers, especially if we're going to the porn sites, the NSA wants to know that because when they find you're going there, they know you have no power to resist them. The purpose of porn and that wicked sin is to weaken a nation so it has no conscience, it has no faith, it has no courage to stand against the international white power structure of the Pope of Rome. That's why they put it upon us. Jesuits go on, and they say, I do further promise and declare that notwithstanding I am dispensed with to assume any religion heretical for the propagation of the mother church interests. You know what that means? That means they'll pretend to be a Jew if they want to further the church interest. Tell me, that Rabbi Metzer in Jerusalem, any self-respecting Jew would never allow the Pope to come to Jerusalem or Israel. Rabbi Metzer does. You know why? Because he's a knight of St. Gregory, I believe. He's a Pope-serving Jew, a Pope-serving rabbi. Remember Israel Zalim? He was uh, the rabbi of Rome, the dear friend of Pius XII. And Israel Zali, he decided that, well, he's not going to resist the Pope in the rounding up of the Jews of Rome and the Jew Rome Jewish ghetto and sending them to Auschwitz. And later, Israel Zali changes his name to Eugenio Zali after Eugenio Pacelli, the name of the Pope Pius XII there, and shows that these Jewish rabbis are busy serving the Pope to the destruction of their own people. How, why do you think the Holocaust was a success? Because he had all these treasonous rabbis all across Europe and in Eastern Europe busy calling for their people to submit rather than getting guns and resisting the Nazis as well as the communists in their destruction. The Jesuits pretended to be rabbis, pretended to be Jews. The Jesuits also pretend to be Muslims. That's why we had a Jesuit coadjutor years ago when the Jesuits founded their kingdom of Saudi Arabia in 1932 using M Mussolini and Winston Churchill. They put Ibn Saud in the place there. Ibn Saud was the leader of the Wahhabis. The Wahhabis were founded by the Jesuits using British intelligence. The Wahhabis are a thousand times more fanatical than the average Sunni Muslims. So we're going to use the Wahhabi family of the Saud dynasty to control Mecca and Medina for our purposes. The Saudi royal family at the top are all top Jesuits. And I will tell you this. They're busy plotting the destruction of Mecca, Medina, and the mosques of Jerusalem. That's right. The Jesuits in the high places of power without Islam, inside of Islam, are going to do this. And they're going to blame it on us in America, I think. The Jesuits assume the garb of Muslims, the garb of Jews. And that's why the Jesuit Yasser Arafat can have a business deal with the Jesuit Shimon Peres in a, in a telephone company in Israel called Paltel. 
And they can have mutual stocks in the same telephone company. <laughs> That's why Yasser Arafat can die with over a billion dollars, and his wife is a French Roman Catholic. Yasser Arafat was a Jesuit coadjutor. But let's, let's bring it home even closer, because I really want to offend you, my white brothers, today. It's my purpose to really offend you and get you fired up. Billy Graham is a Jesuit coadjutor. You read the book, Billy Graham and His Friends by Kathy Burns. Read it. Just get it and read it. Billy Graham and His Friends by Kathy Burns. He'll show you his connection with the CFR. He'll show you his connection with Rome. He'll show you his connection with all these other wicked sinners. I show that his connection in the assassination of Kennedy in my book, the bosom right-hand friend of Lyndon Baines Johnson was Billy, Billy Graham. I show Billy Graham at the funeral of LBJ, weeping for him and oh, poor LBJ. That filthy, fornicating, murderous, spiritual bastard LBJ, high-level Freemason, inducted in the lodge at Johnson City in Texas in 1936. Billy Graham was at the funeral of his buddy Freemason because Billy Graham was a 33rd degree Freemason according to uh, the book uh, The Deadly Deception by Jim Shaw. He said when he was inducted in the 33rd degree in the temple in Washington, there was an international evangelist there, and that was Billy Graham. Oh, but Billy Graham, oh, 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 Wheaton College and all that. Oh, and make a decision for Christ and all that Armenian wicked theology that Graham Pope put forward and then called the Pope the greatest moral leader in the world. Billy Graham's a sellout. He's a traitor. He's a Jesuit coadjutor. And all you Christian Bible believers following him are in sin. But let's go a little farther. Let's talk about Kenny Copeland. Isn't that right, Kenny? Kenneth Copeland, the 33rd degree Freemason, who said that he was God, I am! I am, I am, that blasphemer. And then in this recent video that he's put out where he, where this Jesuit priest is videoing him, where he is being videoed with all of his, all of his duped followers behind him, talking to Francis the first, well, uh, sir, a uh, sir, we have come home, or we are going to reunite with Rome over my dead body. Over my bleeding and burning nation before we ever realign with the Pope of Rome. Because that's what he's going to do to it anyway. What do you think he has planned here when he brings his fascists to power? According to Louis Free, that Opus Dei, former head of the FBI, there were what, over 200 secretly buried nukes in this country, done by the Russians, of course. You know, they're going to start detonating nukes in major cities, and it's all going to be from the Pope. And this is going to be a righteous judgment from God on a people that rejected his word, his son, their history, the wonderful things that he's blessed us with because we went to unite with the Pope's Antichrist in Rome. You want to serve the Antichrist? I'll give you Antichrist government. I'll let the Antichrist do what he wants to do, and that's going to kill you. I'll let him open up the camps. All these trains can start running with their boxcars with shackles in them, and we're going to bring hundreds of thousands of people to the camps in this country, throughout the country every week, and we're going to kill them all there. That's right. Yeah. Listen, if God would do that to his own beloved nation of Israel by bringing the Babylonians in and slaughtering hundreds of thousands of them and taking the rest way to, to, to Babylon as captives, if he used the Romans to kill approximately a million people in Jerusalem in 70 A.D., and he raised, raised up uh, uh, Flavius Josephus to tell the Jewish people there in his Antiquities of the Jews that Jesus and Messiah, Jesus of Nazareth was a Messiah. He was a promised Messiah. And still they would not believe in addition to the word of God. If they would not believe, if they would not nationally turn because of all the miracles and what was happening, then God would give them over to destruction. And he did. 
The Jews were taken off as captives. They were taken to North Africa. They were taken into Europe. If he would do that to his own nation, what do you think he's going to do here? To a, a bunch of race-mixed, miscegenated, white, black, Asian, Hispanic Gentiles in this country that refuse to listen to his word. What do you think he's going to do here? I'll tell you what he's doing. He's preparing a host, a huge Asian host for our invasion. He's preparing a Russian host for our invasion. He's preparing a Muslim host for our invasion. That's right. It's going to be Constantinople all over again. And you read what the Muslims did to those Orthodox Christians in Constantinople. Who chose to have essentially the religion of Rome and the worship of Mary? The Jesuit continues on here, and he says, I do further promise and declare that notwithstanding I am dispensed with to assume any religion heretical for the propagation of the Mother Church's interest. We dealt with Kenneth Copeland, Billy Graham. How about Benny Hinn? There's another Jesuit par excellence. Looks like a priest with that little white collar around his neck there. He's a Jesuit. Jack Van Ampey, he's another Jesuit coadjutor that will never tell you the power of the Jesuits. I never forget when I was with my mother-in-law uh, helping her with her cancer treatment there in Reno. We were watching Jack Van Ampey there, and I, I, what he said was, and the Jesuits at the great Georgetown University. And I thought, what? Jack Van Ampey's busy serving the Jesuits of Rome. Because he will never tell you the history of Rome, the history of Protestantism, the history of what those wicked Jesuits have done for the last 400 years. He'll never tell you that because he's working for them. Paul Crouch and that, and that wicked wife of his, when they had TBN, Paul Crouch busy served the Jesuits. TBN is a Jesuit operation. And if you don't believe me, just go to Orlando in Florida and you go to TBN and they have certain things that are very Roman Catholic there. Of course, they got the Roman Catholic Jesus with long hair. And the Lord Jesus Christ of the Scriptures never had long hair. He never had a cute little goatee either. He had a long beard and he had short hair. That's the true Yeshua HaMashiach of the Scriptures. But oh no, we got to have a Roman Catholic Jesus with long hair and fair skin and blue eyes. That's right. No, we are inundated with false preachers. Another talk, talk about the black sheep preachers. Creflo Dollar and T.D. Jakes. They're busy serving the Pope of Rome. You know why? Because they have TV programs. Tony, Tony Evans, who's always on around here on, uh, on uh, w, w, what is it? W, uh, DAC out here in Pennsylvania, he's busy serving the Jesuits because he'll never tell his own black people who ran the slave trade. He'll never tell the black people who were the ones who wanted to do away with the slave trade, who were the ones who did away with it. They were white Protestants, men like Wilbur, William Wilberforce and Thomas uh, Clarkson and Granville Sharp and other Englishmen that were Protestants and Bible believers doing away with the Pope's damnable slave trade run by the Roman Catholic monarchs, the Stuarts and the others. Can't tell them that now. We got to teach all the black folk that all the white people are the same, including the Protestants. No. We're going to control every faction. And then the Nation of Islam. We'll use Ferris, Louis Farrakhan. He's been an FBI informant since 1964. And I was taught that by a former member of the nation, AJ. It goes by the name of AJ. If you're interested, you email me. I'll give you his email. I'm sure he'd be glad to talk to you. He helped me with my book when I was dealing with Malcolm X, when the Francis Cardinal Spellman killed him in 1965 in Audubon Ballroom. He was in the high command of the FBI and the New York Police Department, the high command, high leaders of the black nation of Islam, all working together. And guess what? Nobody goes to jail except those two little black assailants, Hire, uh, Hire and who, Hare and who the others were. Got to have your fall, guys, now, but we can't go after the ones who really oversaw it, like Francis Cardinal Spellman. We can't deal with that, can we? All the leaders, Jesse Jackson, Louis Farrakhan, <laughs> uh, Al Sharpton, and this goes on and on and on and on, all busy, the, the leader of the Ku Klux Klan. 
the high-level leaders of Scottish Rite Freemasonry, the John Birch Society, the right-wing John Birchers, uh, the, the left-wing uh, uh, Southern Poverty Law Center with that Jew serving the Pope, Morris Dees. We got to have them all. We run them all. We run all the religions. We run all the politics. And anybody that wants to get in the way, we're going to remove them unless they're protected by the Son of God. So we're going to make sure they're not protected by the Son of God because we're going to get them into sin. And we will surely get them into sin with our pornography. And if we can't get them into sin there, we'll get them into sin by taking money from us. That's right. Taking bribes so that we give them money and then they won't talk against us. That's right. Lust of the flesh, lust of, lust of the eyes, pride of life, money, sex, and power. Somewhere we're going to get them there. But if he lives a pure life, and if we can't get him there, then we'll do our best to kill him. And that's when we're going to have to deal with the Son of God. Because if the Son of God doesn't permit us to kill him, we can't kill him. And that's where you want to be. You want to have a pure life, protected by the Son of God, doing His will here, and confronting this world with its sin, its hatred for God, its hatred for Christ, its hatred for the Bible, its hatred for the Reformation, its hatred for the, the wonderful doctrines of grace, while giving the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving the remedy, the solution to the problem of all men's sins, without exception, without reservation. You want to do that, and the Lord will bless you, and He'll take care of you. You'll have sweet fellowship with him because you and the Lord are a majority. And so it doesn't matter how many Jesuits ally themselves against you, God holds their very breath in his hand and can snuff them out anytime he wants to as you're busy praying and seeking the Lord in Jesus' name. I just finished furnishing out, almost furnishing out my my uh, meeting house, which I call my chapel. And I got all my flags yesterday, hung them up. I got the beautiful Pennsylvania flag. First of all, I got the, I have the glorious Baptist flag. That we Baptists, God used us, whatever name we were called, the, the Baptists, the Bogomils, whatever, all through the Huguenots, the, the Waldensians. He, he took care of us all throughout the Pope's Dark Ages. And and he used us to get the, the scriptures, the Byzantine text into Europe. And, and then we, we're, we helped the Reformation. We helped the Reformers, even though some of the Reformers persecuted us, the Reformed people. Nonetheless, we still forgive them and love them. And so I have the Baptist flag in my, church, in, my, in my meeting house. And then next to it, I have a higher flag. I got the higher flag pole. And it's the flag of the Protestant Reformation. They call it the Christian flag. But it's the flag of the Reformation that Luther designed. It's white with a background with a blue square and a red cross in the middle. And I'm not for wearing the cross, but Luther designed it, and Luther's the father of the Protestant Reformation, so I respect him and love him, so I have the flag of the Reformation there that ultimately brought us out of the Pope's Dark Ages. So I have that flag. And then the next flag I have hanging up is the beautiful, glorious, wonderful cloth flag of the sovereign nation state of Pennsylvania, when in 1776... We declared our independence and became a sovereign nation among nations. And then in the Articles of Confederation, we confederated together for certain limited reasons. Although it was a perpetual union, we didn't like that. So we then had a written constitution and replaced the Articles of Confession with a, a con Articles of Confederation with a written constitution. And so therefore, we entered into an alliance with 13 other sovereign nation states, and that was called these United States of America. So I have the next flag is my... United States, flag of the United States with 13 stars in a circle. And then the next flag I have is the flag of the United States with 33 stars on it. The amount of nation states that were in the Federal Union at the time the war between the states, states broke out. And then I have the glorious and beautiful stars and bars, the Confederate flag there, where they decided to assume their station of sovereign power in among the, in, in the earth. And those, what, 11, 30, 11 southern states uh, confederated together, and they called themselves the Southern Confederacy. And a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant wrote the Constitution for the Southern Confederacy. They didn't leave because they wanted to preserve slavery. They left because their rights were violated. And their property attempted to be taken. They were being taxed to death. To, a host of things were happening. And then after the war between the states, 14th Amendment was passed. And we have now a second republic 
which is a centralized government in Washington, D.C., where you're first a citizen of the United States and the state when you reside. Therefore, we have a, I have the 48-star flag with a small uh, two-by-three flag of Pennsylvania. So I have those two flags. And then on March 9th, 1933, they put us under the Trading with the Enemy Act by way of the Emergency Banking Relief Act, so everybody's deemed an enemy within the United States, and every flag, indoor flag that's flown is trimmed in gold fringe. It's the flag of the chief executive. It's the flag of the conqueror. So I got a gold fringe American flag, gold fringe flag of the United States, trimmed in gold fringe. And then I got a gold fringe flag of Pennsylvania that's two by three, showing its subordination to Washington, and it too is under emergency war powers. And then the last flag I have hanging up, to where it's all going anyway is the flag of the sovereign state of Vatican City because you see it's this government under emergency war powers under the trading with the enemy act that is busy serving the Pope of Rome the Pope the world dictator runs the commander in chief of America Barry Davis Obama and his right hand man Joe Biden my flags in my chapel tell the story and the last flag that I have designed hanging up on my wall is the flag of Probaptica. It's a beautiful flag. That's going to be the flag of our new nation. A portion of, we'll, we'll have it out of a portion of Pennsylvania when Pennsylvania finally declares its independence. That's what we're going to have. I have the four faces of the cherubim on there, the face of an ox, the face of a man, the face of an eagle, the face of a lion. I have the name of God in Hebrew, I am. And I have the name of God in Greek, ego I me there. I have a candelabra, seven, seven candled candlestick there. And on the other side, I have a four-pointed star of the Lord Jesus Christ, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, and it's a white star. Then I have the seal of Pennsylvania on the flag. And over it, the son of righteousness with healing in his wings. And then I have the seven eyes around the Pennsylvania seal, the seven eyes symbolizing the seven spirits of God, the Holy Ghost as he will protect us in our new nation. We have the AV 1611 Reformation Bible on the top. On one side, Sola Scriptura. On the other side, Common Law. And at the bottom, Probaptical. That's our flag for our new sovereign nation. Will you join me? It's time to dream. It's time to have vision. We'll be back in a moment. After prayer. This is 24-7 World Radio. This is Richard Began, host of the Gospel in French broadcast on 24-7 World Radio. Ici Richard Bégin, votre animateur pour l'émission Évangile en français sur les ondes de 24 sur 7 World Radio. I teach the French-speaking people of the world the gospel of Jesus Christ, and I defend the French Calvinists against the Jesuits. J'enseignerai aux francophones du monde l'Évangile de Jésus-Christ et la défense des Calvinistes français contre les Jésuites. Join me for an entire French broadcast every Wednesday at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, right here on 247worldradio.com. Soyez avec nous pour cette émission entièrement francophone à tous les mercredis à 2 h p.m. Heure de l'Est, ici même, sur 24 sur 7, worldradio.com. This is Brother Nicholas. Join me every Tuesday at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for the German Bible Truth Hour and at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for the Dutch Bible Truth Hour on 24-7 World Radio. This is Bruder Nicolas. Ich lade euch herzlich ein, mich anzuhören, jeder Dienstag am 2 Uhr nachmittags, amerikanische Zeit, für die Deutsche Bibelwahrheitsstunde und 3 Uhr amerikanische Standardzeit für die niederländische Bibelwahrheitsstunde am World Radio 24-7. Dit is Bruder Nico. Ich bin hartelijk uitgenodigd om elke Dinsdag om 2 Uhr amerikanische Standardzeit het Duitse Bijbelwaarheidsuur te volgen en 3 Uhr amerikanische Standardzeit het Nederlandse Bijbelwaarheidsuur te volgen. Op 24-7 World Radio.
This is Fernando Castaneda, host of Christianity Today on 24-7 World Radio. Each Tuesday and Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern, I present the spiritual condition of the church today, comparing how the church should be according to the A.D. 1611 Reformation Bible. And ladies, join my wife, Candra, during the second half of each show for teaching specifically for you, pursuant to Titus chapter 2, verses 3 through 5. So join us for Christianity Today every Tuesday and Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, right here on 247worldradio.com. You're listening to 247 World Radio. Remember there, John Phelps, back with our topic of vision. And I'll finish up the Jesuit vision here that they have given us in their oath. And he says, I do furthermore promise and declare that I will, when opportunity presents, make and wage relentless war, secretly or openly against all heretics, Protestants and liberals, as I am directed to do to extirpate them from the face of the whole earth. I'm going to kill them all. I want to extirpate them all from the face of the whole earth. That's why when we Jesuits in control of Joseph Stalin and his Red Army, when we begin to invade Germany, we're going we're gonna to command all the, all the Russian soldiers to rape the German women to their delight. Because, you see, we have to bastardize the German race. What we can't kill, we want to bastardize. We want to race mix so that there won't be any pure-blooded Protestant Germans anymore because we are not going to have another Protestant Reformation in Prussia. You see how the Jesuits were busy fulfilling their oath? And that I will spare neither age, sex, or condition, and that I will hang, burn, waste, boil, flay, strangle, and bury alive these infamous heretics. Who do you think taught the Indian nations in this country to scalp? They didn't. That was not a creation of the Indian nations, scalping the white man. They were taught that by the Jesuits when the Jesuits were among the French. And they taught those Indians to scalp the white Protestants. Because that's all that was here in the 13 colonies. Kill them, kill their children, kill their women, scalp their women, their men, get a nice head of hair for a scalp. They like the red ones too, by the way. They like those red scalps. The Jesuits taught them how to do that. In fulfillment of their bloody oath, that I will flay. I'm going to flay their hair right off their head. Strangle, bury alive these infamous heretics. Rip up the stomachs and wombs of their women. You realize that's what the Croatian Ustashi did to the Serbian Orthodox in World War II? You know what they used to do? They used to cut open a pregnant woman, pull out the baby, and put a cat inside of it. Mm -hmm. I think you need to know some of these things. You need to know. And then they would actually step inside the woman there to warm their cold feet. That's what the Jesuit Ustashi did. And then they would cut out the eyes and they would have these eyeball necklaces. Mm -hmm. All fulfilling the Jesuit oath. Rip up the stomachs and wombs of their women and crush their infants' heads against the walls. When the Jesuits were running the Einsatzgruppen, the four different Einsatzgruppen that invaded Russia, the purpose of the SS Einsatzgruppen was, was, was manned by criminals, by the way. And these fil filthy, dirty, despicable criminals would go into these Jewish communities in Russia. And one of the things they would do is they would take the babies by the feet, or the young children by the feet, and go up to a concrete wall and smash their heads against the wall. That's what the Einsatzgruppen did. You didn't do that. They sure did it. It's in the book, uh, The Order of the Death's Head. You get it. Wow. Wow. Oh, this, I have a book right here. It's called The Order of the Death's Head. 
And one of the men in the Einstein group said it popped. It popped like a tire, like a tire popping when you when a when a car would blow a tire. A huge pop. That's how the head would sound when they bashed it against the wall. That's what they're going to do here. In fulfilling the Jesuit oath, crush their infants' heads against the walls in order to annihilate their execrable race. This is a race war. They're engaged in race war. That's why they incite the blacks in this country to hate white people. That's why they delight in seeing all the black-on-white crime in the major cities. I call them majority savage blacks. The, mi the minority civil blacks, they don't do these things because I know a few of them. And we're friends, some of my brethren, in Christ. But these majority savage blacks, man, they hate white people, and they can't wait to perpetrate a crime against us. That's why you got these black savages walking down the street, and all of a sudden, it's called the game of knockout. We're going to try to knock out the white man. And they do. That's America. All you foreigners listening, that's what's going on here. There's been a black-on-white race war since the Civil Rights Movement. It just gets worse every year because we're in the second Reconstruction. In the first Reconstruction, at least those white folks had the first Ku Klux Klan to put a stop to that. We don't have anything to put a stop to it here. And the first Ku Klux Klan was good. It's the second clan that was evil, found in 1915 at Stone Mountain, Georgia. First clan stopped these Yankee carpetbaggers, thieves and murderers, inciting the blacks to hate the white people. It didn't succeed. They couldn't incite a race war because the black, well, the whites were generally good to the blacks, and the blacks didn't want to kill the white folk. But there were some who did, raping the white women and so on. So there were, the clan just took. So we're not putting up with this, and we have to have our night rides. And we get these carpetbaggers. We're going to get these, these uh, scallywag southern traders. We're going to get these black savages busy raping our women. And they took care of business. And that restored order in the South by 1877. Can't do that here, you see, because you can't, there's no law here. There's no order here. The order here is about the destruction of the white man. That's the order in this country. Isn't that right, NSA? Isn't that right, Jesuits? Isn't that right? All you judges. Black man's tried for a crime here. Well, he had a horrible upbringing. His father was be beat him or he molested him. So we're going to let the black man walk. I know a black man that killed a white man, shot him in the back of the head. He got three years. Three years. That's okay. He just killed a white man. That's all right. But you make a statement like, I don't want you to bring your black boyfriends to the black basketball game. We're going to fine you two and a half million dollars, boy that they call us mother effers every day, every single day. Who's that white mother effer? Talk about racism. See, this is why we need our own country, white men, with no Jesuits in it to incite these blacks against us, as is the ministry of Father Flager down there in Chicago working for the Jesuits at Loyola. Inciting the blacks to hate the white man so we can have our race war and then we can institute martial law and then the white fascists will come to power and there'll be certain priests that say, oh, this is bad, this is terrible and we're going to then haul off all these blacks to the concentration camps. You remember, you remember Oliver North in the Iran-Contra hearings. He said in that hearing that we're, they were going, they planned to incarcerate 21 million American Negroes. Mm -hmm. and you know what? They're going to deserve it for all the hateful black-on-white crime they have perpetrated against us for the last 60 years. God's going to deal with it. And that crime has been encouraged by the Jesuits because, you see, we've got to get rid of this execrable race. And by the way, they not only want to kill off the whites, but also the blacks that are Baptists, that are heretics too. All you blacks who believe the Bible, you're on a death list. You're heretics, man. They're planning on killing you with the Pope's right-wing socialist, communist, socialist, fascist CIA and NSA. Busy working for the Pope of Rome, keeping all the little secrets from us. They don't have any secrets from the Pope. They don't have any secrets from the other intelligence communities. The only secrets being kept are against us. 
Because we're the enemy under the Trading with the Enemy Act. And we're treated like the enemy every day by this government. The Jesuit goes on and says, that when the same cannot be done openly, I will secretly use the poison cup, the strangulation cord, the steel of the poignard, or the leaden bullet, regardless of the honor, rank, dignity, or authority of the person or persons. Whatever may be their condition in life, either public or private, as I at any time may be directed to so to do by any agent of the Pope or superior of the Brotherhood of the Holy Father of the Society of Jesus. They're assassins. They're mercs. And you see, the, the beautiful thing, the marvelous thing that the Jesuits have accomplished now in the perfection of their international intelligence community is they have a whole bunch of choices they can make when they want to kill somebody. Let me see, who should we use? Should we use, oh, the mafia family in Chicago? Should we use one of their hitmen? Or should we use oh, one of the FBI, one of the CIA wet boys? Should we use one of the jackals? See, they're all names for assassins. Well, who should we use? Or should we, you know, call our friend Louis Farrakhan and get one of his black assassins there in the nation of Islam and in the, in the fruit of Islam in that army and send out one of his assassins? Who should we use? The Jesuits have all kinds of choices, but they themselves don't carry out any assassinations as they used to. They use their trusted third parties. That's their vision. That's what they do. And so what do we do? Well, the first thing we do, my white brother, is we have to understand there's nothing we can do in and of ourselves. Nothing. Christ said to his disciples, without me, you can do nothing. And those were people that were saved. How much more are those that are unsaved? You can't do anything about this, my friend. So therefore, the first thing that you must do is you must truly repent of your sins. Acts chapter 17, verse 20. Acts chapter 17, verse 20. And the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent, because he hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, and that he hath raised him from the dead. Listen, it's time to repent, because Jesus Christ is risen from the dead, and he's going to judge you. You're going to meet him one of these days. He's going to give you an inquest at the great white throne judgment. He died for your sins. He paid the price for you, but you would not have it anything to do with him. So you know what? You're going to go there to the great white throne, and when you're resurrected, and you're going to give account of every idle word, every deed, everything you ever did, unless you repent. Unless you repent, you shall likewise perish. Now that I've truly repented by the grace of God, repent unto what? To believe the gospel, that Christ died for my sins, that he was buried and rose again. Everything you ever did can be forgiven by the grace of God in Christ through the precious shed blood of him. See, that's, that's the money God used to redeem us with. We were purchased with his blood. Lord Jesus Christ holds legal title to every man who ever lived. He purchased every man with his blood, and one of these days he's going to exercise uh, equitable title either at the at the first resurrection, the judgment seat of Christ, the first resurrection, or the second resurrection. Either way, he's just going to deal with all of his property. The devil has the beneficial use of unsaved man, but the legal title, huh, the Lord Jesus Christ holds legal title, and one day all beneficial equitable title. God's commanded all men everywhere to repent and to believe this gospel. And now that you're saved, because as many as received him, to them gave you power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. To wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them. Wherefore, we beg you in Christ, be ye reconciled to God. Now that you've been individually reconciled by personally believing the gospel, having repented of your sins, now you have been indwelled by the Spirit of God, sealed to the day of redemption. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God by whom you are sealed to the day of redemption. You now have the Spirit of God to empower you to live godly, 
to empower you to obey the Word of God, and to empower you to resist the devil, his demons, his devils, his unclean spirits, his evil angels, whatever you want to call them, and to then resist his great second cause, the Roman papacy. If you're in Christ, you now have the spiritual power to resist the devil's Roman papacy. And that's my prayer. That you men in places of economic influence, political power, judiciary, wherever you might be, lawyers, doctors, all your professionals, that you might begin to do what is right in your area of influence and begin to resist the Jesuit order. I understand now that after I've been harping on the Trading with the Enemy Act, for months, calling people to take my course for months. But George Norrie on Coast to Coast talking about trading with the Enemy Act. Good for you, George Norrie, even though you're trained by Jesuits at University of Detroit Mercy and busy covering for them, at least you're being forced to deal with the trading with the Enemy Act. My prayer for you is, sir, that you be saved, that you be born again, and throw off the Jesuit power in your life and begin to tell the whole truth. It's like you, Alex Jones. It's my prayer that you truly be saved by the grace of God. Come to know Christ personally and begin to tell the truth about the Knights of Malta, including your father-in-law, Edmund Lowe Nichols, and tell him how the Knights run everything, how the Jesuits use the Knights and the papacy to destroy this place, bringing fascism to power. When we start bringing it all home to Rome and trusting God for deliverance, then God will get involved. And that's what we want. We want God to get involved. We want God to start intervening on our behalf. We want God to start answering our prayers as we pour our hearts out to him and ask him specifically, Oh, Father, in Jesus' name, we pray thee that you will begin to set back the power of the Jesuit order in America. Expose them for the evil works that they've done. Show how they've killed millions and millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of people uh, in the 20th century, the 19th and 20th centuries. Oh God, we pray in Jesus' name that you would use men of your choosing to do this. And you know what? He will. Because you're praying not for yourself. You're praying to do his will. And it's his will that we resist evil. How do we know that? Because the Apostle Paul, when the Lord used him to write the book of Hebrews, put a little verse in here. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and following. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of, finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. Well, the Puritans resisted unto blood, striving against sin hundreds of times. They resisted unto blood. At Nasby, at Edge Hill, Dunbar, Worcester. All the big battles of the Puritan Revolution, as they were led by Cromwell and others of the Parliament, to set back the power of the king controlled by the Jesuits, these Puritans bled a river for English liberty. And joyfully so. When they would march into battle, begin to walk their horses and, and, and begin to get them into a swift trot and then a gallop with their pikes lowered, they would be crying, the Lord of hosts, the Lord of hosts, a thousand of Cromwell's Ironsides, the Lord of hosts. They resisted sin unto the shedding of blood. Their blood and their enemy's blood. 
when George Washington crossed the Delaware and, start, and started capturing those dirty, filthy Hessian Germans, those drunks, those Puritan American Calvinists out of Massachusetts and some of the other states in Virginia resisted sin under the shedding of blood. Led by that for great general, Benedict Arnold, before he turned traitor, those Puritans shed their blood and resisted unto death all the British power that they had there at Saratoga, and Saratoga became one of the most key battles in the winning of the American Revolution and one of the 15 key battles in world history led by Puritans. Benedict Arnold was a white Anglo-Saxon Presbyterian Calvinist. Those Puritans used Romans 13 as a justification to resist unbridled tyranny. You read the works that work on unconditional submission to government by the great uh, Thomas uh, Jonathan Mayhew. Get the treatise. Read it carefully. He shows you Romans 13 justifies revolting against an absolute military and, and political power. Because God didn't grant it there. He created government for the punishment of evil and the, and the reward of good. And if it doesn't do that, it's a tyranny. And we have the, every responsibility to resist it, even if you have a tyrant for a husband or a, or a wife. That's right. God does validate divorce for certain reasons in the Bible. That's right. And we need a political divorce from this government, this emergency war powers government. And it's going to take Puritan, Bible-believing men of God that are experts in their field, in, in the martial field, in the judicial field, in the political field, in the diplomatic field, and in the common man field, especially as common men, to successfully throw off their power. that God would intervene on our behalf and answer our prayers rather than be against us as he is now. God is against us. He's against the people of this country now. But that can change if there would truly be a repentance, a great awakening unto righteousness, a resistance to sin, personal sin, and a resistance to political tyranny, all filtering over here from the wicked Pope of Rome. God's done it before. He did it three times before here, and we need a fourth great awakening. If you don't listen to me, listen to our great brother Bowser on this radio station, Arthur Bowser. He'll teach you of the Great Awakenings. He's one of the foremost authorities in the world on Great Awakenings. And I pray that God gives him another 10 years of life. So in conclusion of this broadcast, my desire is to give you vision. The Jesuits have a vision, and we need one. Will you help me? Will you be a supporter every month? Will you send 50 bucks a month to this broadcast, to this ministry? It's my desire that you will. If you can give more, give more. We need some serious financing around here. We have to want to build the radio station. I have some bills to pay around here. We need some help from you men with money. Because I can't do it without your money. I did the research. I got the guys on the radio. By the grace of God, we got a wonderful radio station. That all happened. Now we need your money to help us. Will you help us? Send your gift to Reformation Bible Trust, P.O. Box 306, Newmanstown, Pennsylvania, 17073. Want to be a monthly supporter? Go to my website, 247worldradio.com and or vaticanassassins.org. Go there, become a monthly supporter. Sign up. Become a monthly supporter. Or go to my store. Go to my Amazon store. If there's things you want to order on Amazon, order it through my store and I get a little from it. Amazon has millions of products. There's something there I'm sure you need to buy every now and then. Buy it through my store and help me there. Go to my websites again. Order my book. Download my book, Vatican Assassins. Winter in the House of My Friends. Download it to your Kindle or to your computer, $24.95. And order my books. Order my ebook. Order my PowerPoint. My Con Con. My Truth Con. Order my Seven Transitions of American Citizenship. There's nothing like it. Took me a year to write and another six months to perfect it. Take my course. Take my course. Call me, 610-589-5300. Call me. Sign up for my course in May, 16th, 17th, and 18th. It's a three-day course, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. I'm going to teach you the course on private American citizenship. 
And one of the benefits is when you become a private citizen, you no longer owe the Pope's war tax that he's put upon all persons subject to the jurisdiction of the United States under the Emergency Banking Relief Act that extended the Trading with the Enemy Act to you. You need to take my course. It's worth seventeen fifty just to get your status right. Call me. Take the course. We'll have a great time, great food, and you'll meet some people that you'll be probably friends with for the rest of your life because they want to be free too. If you're a Christian, you need to cease to be surety for a stranger. He that is surety for a stranger shall surely smart for it. No longer you need, cannot be surety. Surety no more. Take my course. Become a private citizen under Section 1 of the 14th Amendment and uphold the Constitution as we are supposed to as Christian nationalists. Again, call me, 610-589-5300. Make a reservation for my course. I only take four to six people. I have two right now. Each class, I need to give special attention to each student. Will you help me? Will you help yourself? Will you join me? We have financed this ministry. We have financed the vision of having a new white Protestant and Baptist nation somewhere here in what's left of Pennsylvania. Will you help me? Will you pray for me? Same way with you black men. You want your own nation, your own black nation that's Bible-based? Help me. I'll help you get it. You can border my country, and we can trade with one another. Let's have vision. Let's trust God. Let's do what he wants us to do. And watch him work his work in his providential, wondrous way as we worship and adore him for who he is and for answering our prayers. Until Friday, may the Lord bless you as you seek to do His will according to His word, the AV 1611 Reformation Bible. I'll be on with Dorothy again. Appreciate your prayers. I need your prayers 60 seconds a day, as well as your support. So until then, Maranatha, and may the Lord bless you. is 24-7 World Radio. From Feature Story News in 